I want to spend just a couple of minutes reviewing. I'll try to do this every Sunday if I remember so we can rejog our minds about where we're at. But we're about to head off into 1 Corinthians, recall, and there's a whole lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of symptoms, and we've talked about this. But of all the symptoms, there is one overarching problem, and I want to point that out to you this morning. Let me just, you'll remember some of the symptoms. There was a lot of division in the church. They had over-spiritualized baptisms, over-spiritualized preaching. They were boasting in men. In five, you had immorality. In six, you had lawsuits. In seven, you had divorce. Uh, this is a typical church, right? Not only that, but they had misused God's liberties that He had given them in Christ. They had misused God's gifts that He had given them in Christ. And then in the time you get to chapter 15, you find out that they had tolerated poor teaching about the resurrection. So this, this church is a train wreck. And you'll hear preachers say, you'll eat, I even noticed it yesterday, me and the girls went to Auburn, and you pass a thousand churches between here and Auburn. And some of them were the name, the apostolic church of so-and-so, trying to get back to the days of the apostolic church in 1 Corinthians and Acts. I'm thinking, no thanks, man. I don't want to go back there. They had all kinds of problems. And so that's exactly what we see at Corinth. But there's one overarching problem, and I want to point those out to you. If you have your Bibles, you're in chapter 1. Look at chapter 2 with me very quickly. And let me read to you just the first six verses. And again, once I read these passages, you'll see the big problem at Corinth. But I'll start in chapter 2, verse 1. It says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Now look at verse 6. Yet, we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. Now look at chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, Brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. Flip on forward to chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13, look at verse 11. Paul scatters this throughout the entire letter to the church at Corinth. First Corinthians chapter 11, first chapter 13, verse 11, Paul says, "When I was a child, I used to speak like a child. I used to think like a child, reason like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. Last one I want to point out to you is chapter 14. Turn forward, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20. I think, and I called Steve last week, and I said, man, this is where I'm dropping the centerpiece of 1 Corinthians. Am I close? And he said, yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think this is the centerpiece of the problem of the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. Now trail back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Or I tell you what, go to chapter 2. Here's the deal while you're turning there. We've all got issues. Your pastor's got issues, okay? Hopefully they're issues of the Spirit and not issues of the flesh. We've got both issues, okay? Some things we struggle out here in this life. They're obvious to everybody, right? But there are internal or spiritual issues that we have where we struggle with pride or we struggle with our thoughts or we struggle with these sort of things that are not necessarily noticeable, but yet we struggle with them nonetheless. But it doesn't matter where you are this morning and what your struggle is. Just know this, you're not alone. The person sitting on your right, the person sitting on your left has struggles. We're still in the flesh. We're still sinful. But also know this, the problem with everybody in the room is our thinking. We are childish, pastor included, in our thinking. We need to grow up in the way that we think, and we need to learn to think with the mind of Christ. In fact, that's the very thing Paul says. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 16. 
Paul says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, if you're like me, your first reaction to that is that is absolutely absurd. I do not have the mind of Christ. But yes, you do. If you are bought and been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, when the Spirit of God came to indwell in you, you were given the mind of Christ. You just don't walk in it. Your childish and immature pastor included in your thinking. In this whole book, Paul is going to address the way that they think. Remember this passage? You probably memorized this in BBS or something. Romans 12, 2. Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. Listen, until we learn how to think differently, we are not going to learn how to act differently. It's not a matter of outside acting or doing. Okay, I can put, and I, I, we do this, we've moved the dog inside during the winter. I'm trying to build a relationship with this goofball dog. I have the most goofy dog on the planet. I've got this collar, and it has a little electronic collar, and I'll put that collar on that dog, and that dog will sit down and drink a cup of coffee with me. I'm kidding. He is so good, though. You take that collar off, he's berserk. She is. She's six years old and she acts like she's six months old. You cannot turn your back, literally. But you put that collar on, oh my goodness, just sit right beside you. Nothing. Leave the room. I'm good. See, those are outside issues, okay? And you can somewhat change what's going on in your outside, but until you learn how to change your thinking, it is not real. You're putting on a show. You're holding your tongue so I won't say an ugly word in front of the pastor. Sorry, that's not real. You change your behavior like I do sometimes when somebody walks in the room. That's not real. Change the way you think so that it will be real. Paul says, this is what I'm trying to do for you. I'm trying to teach you that the Word of God is going to change the way you perceive things. Some of you guys have storm shelters. You know why y'all have a storm shelter? Because you're convinced that you need a storm shelter. Until you got to the place where you thought about it and thought, you know what, I've seen a tornado. They scared me to death. I'm convinced I need a storm shelter. Until you change the way you think, you're probably not going to drop a couple thousand dollars to buy one of those things. So it is with your spiritual life. When you are convinced by the Word of God, about issues, it becomes a reality for you. And the church of Corinth has got all this theology. I mean, for heaven's sakes, Paul preached at Corinth. The apostle Peter preached at Corinth. These guys are not lacking in good preaching. They're lacking in practical living. They actually go around bragging about which preacher they follow. That's absurd. That's bizarre. My pastor's Joey. If you're saying that, you are bizarre, okay? But the point is, it's not an external issue, and Corinth doesn't get that yet. It's an internal issue, and we have to let the Spirit of God change the way that we think. And guess where he does that? He starts right out in verse 1, okay? Now, I'll try to move quickly, because I do want to get to a stopping place uh, this morning before the end of the service. But listen, I know that we look at this, here, verse 1, we're going to spend the rest of the morning on verse 1. Paul called in as apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Now, if you'll sit there and just meditate on that passage, you can see that right out of the gate, Paul immediately begins addressing our thought processes with this, this simple passage. Now, somebody might bring up this issue and say, oh, that's just the standard greeting of Paul. Well, look, if you can see them, let me read them to you. 1 Corinthians is almost exactly like 2 Corinthians. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Romans 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Ephesians 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Colossians 1, Paul, an apostle, 1 Timothy 1, 2 Timothy 1. It's almost exactly the same. You say, well, that's just a standard greeting. No, it's, it's, it's not. Because we have 2 Timothy 3.16, and all Scripture is 
God breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training for righteousness. Every word, you need, you need to get this. Every word in this book is useful because it is of God. If you will get convinced of that when you read Paul, you'll stop and think, what are the implications of this? Because it has implications. Even the punctuation, the accent marks, the breathing marks. What did Jesus say? Not one jot or tittle shall pass away. You remember when Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount? It's all of God. So this is not just some simple passive greeting. Now, before we jump into that, oh, and by the way, let me point this out to you. What was I doing? Showing you that? There's that. There is a slight difference in 1 Corinthians and in Rome, and it's the word called. That's the only time Paul uses the word called, and that's what is so special about his greeting to the 1 Corinthians, and I want to show you that. But first I want to deal with this word, apostle, because you guys hear this today, all right? Uh, in fact, I passed several churches yesterday that had the apostolic church of so-and-so, we have dear friends that go to a church whose pastor calls himself an apostle. That's just bizarre. Um, here's the deal. This word is used 33 times. Just look at the word apostle there, apostolos in the Greek. 33 times in the New Testament. Of those times, it is used 16 times when he's talking about the church of Corinth. Half the number of times he even uses the word apostle, he uses it at the church of Corinth. And the reason being for that is Paul's apostleship was under fire. If you've got your Bible, flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse 1 with me, verse 1 and verse 2. Paul says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Flip over to chapter 15 real quick. Let's see. Let me start in verse... Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and He was raised again on the third day according to Scriptures. That's the Gospel. And watch this in verse 5. And that He appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. After that He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but a few have fallen asleep. And then He appeared to James. And now watch. And then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me as well, for I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of Christ, but by the grace of God, what? I am what I am. And that's the very thing the church at Corinth wanted to dismiss and say, Paul, you know what? You know, you wrote us this letter about we need to change the way that we think, and you got on to us about immorality, and you got on to us about divorce. And man, we don't even think you're an apostle. Why are you writing this letter to us? Okay? And so thus we get 1 Corinthians. He begins to deal with this issue. Now, so that's why I want to deal with this word, because it is an issue in today's culture. But just very quickly, let me just go over the definition of an apostle, Okay? You, don't, you can just jot notes if you want to, or you can just hang on and listen. I'll, there's only one place I'm going to make you turn. Um, Colossians 1, here's the deal. If you're an apostle, number one, you are called. Paul makes that very clear. You have this calling. Okay? Now, friends of ours who have this pastor that claims he's an apostle, he claims he has a calling. Okay? Whatever. All right. Second issue for you to be an apostle, this is where I really struggle with him. You have to see the resurrected Lord. There were 500 of those who got to see that. Nobody's seen the resurrected Lord in the body since those 500 people. Now, if anybody claims to have seen the resurrected Lord since the time of the ascension, just quietly bow out of the conversation and just slide on out the door. 
Okay, that's weird. Nobody has seen the resurrected Lord. But, ex- but what 1 Corinthians says, there were 500 of them, and Paul says, I was one of them. You had to see the Lord. Number three, you had to have a particular message. And that's what Paul does in chapter 15. I preach to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for your sins, he was buried, and he was raised again. That was Paul's primary message. And that's what he preached. Now, there's one very important attribute of an apostle. Turn to chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is where you know we don't have any men living like this today. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 8. Watch what Paul says. He says, you're already filled. He's being sarcastic, by the way. You're already become rich. You have become kings without us. Indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we might also reign with you. And watch what he does in verse 9. I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We apostles are fools for the sake of Christ, but you're prudent in Christ. We're weak. But you're strong, you're distinguished, but we're without honor. To this present hour, we, meaning the apostles, are both hungry and thirsty and poorly clothed and roughly treated, and we're homeless. We toil, working with our hands. When we're reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. When we're slandered, we try to conciliate. When we become as the scum of the world and the dregs of all things, even until now. It's funny those guys running around calling themselves apostles on television. They don't seem to look like the scum of the earth. They don't seem to be homeless to me. They seem to live in a much finer home than me. So I have a very difficult time calling them a biblical apostle. Do you see how the world's gone nuts? Even in the quote-unquote church, this is absolute foolishness. Okay? So when Paul calls himself apostle... You need to know that that is a very real deal. He has authority because he's been called of God to do exactly what he's doing, holding that church accountable, the church that he fathered in the gospel. Now, look back. Go back to 1 Corinthians 1. Let's deal with this issue. Now, like I said, this is a common greeting, but look at the phrasing. Look at these three words or phrases just in this passage that puts emphasis, and you tell me, on Paul or or God. Called. Who did the calling? God did. He is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Who does he belong to? Christ. All this took place by what? The will of God. He was called, he belongs to Christ, and all this took place by the will of God. Is Paul putting emphasis on Paul? No. Not a chance. He's putting emphasis on God. Can you imagine if I said, y'all know my father owns a business, and I'm an employee of my father because my father said I could work at his company. Same thing. What do you think of me? (laughs) What if your dad, you wouldn't have a job. And it puts all the emphasis on my dad because he's done it all. It's his company. He can do what he wants to. And Paul's trying to change the way that they think because we're going to find out Corinth was all about doing the things that they wanted to do. They were running their own show. It was not the what we see in chapter verse 2, the church of God. It was the church of Corinth. And they were doing exactly what they wanted to do. And so right out of the gate, this is not a simple greeting. Paul says, look to the Father. He called me. He placed me in Christ. And all this is being accomplished by His will. It is all of God. Now, we won't point there. But anybody remember how many times the name Jesus Christ was used in the first ten verses last week? Eleven. Try saying 10 sentences and using the same person's name 11 times. It's very difficult to do. Paul did it. And he used Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. You know why he did that? Where is he trying to teach Corinth? Where's the emphasis? It's on Jesus Christ. And we spent all of last week talking about that. 
Our total focus is supposed to be on the person of Christ. Now, so, what do you think when you look at this passage? Is this first verse a demonstration of authority or humility? It's absolute humility. Paul is exercising absolute humility. And you think about what all has gone wrong at this church. Especially if you're a man. You walk into a mess like at Corinth, what's the first thing you're going to do? Y'all sit down, I got this. You need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do that. And you need to do that. That's the first thing we like to do in the flesh. We grab the bull by the horns and say, I got this. I'm called of God. Let me take care of this. If Paul's trying to get started that way, he put way too much emphasis on God's authority and none on himself. Not only that, if you've got your Bibles, turn, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 5. And really, this, is a, this verse is for pastors primarily because we need to have our heads shrunk. But look at this. What then is Apollos? By the way, he's a preacher. What is Paul? Look what he calls himself. Servants. Servants. Preachers. This needs to be preached at a preacher's convention. What is Paul? What is Apollos? They're servants through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Now watch this. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God. If he's trying to put emphasis on himself and his authority, he just blew it there. He just said, all you preachers, all you church leaders, all you whatever, you're nothing. I mean, thank you for doing what you do, but you're nothing. It's God who is doing everything. That's a humbling thing, but that's something we need to be reminded of often. God does everything. Now look at chapter 4. He's not done. Look at chapter 4, verse 1 real quickly. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ. We put everything else, every kind of initial on the end of our name, every kind of title before our name, so a man will regard us as whatever. But if you want to be regarded in the church of God, let it be regarded as a servant of Christ. You've got to change the way you think. We've got to change the way we think. We are servants. That is ex exactly opposite to the teaching of this world. You realize that, don't you? We're trying to get up here. Paul's going, no, you're thinking all wrong. You need to get it down here. Because when you get it down here, you begin to understand that God alone is up here. That's just in the first verse. And why do you need to know this? Well, number one, you need to know this for your own spiritual maturity. We're all the time trying to achieve things. It's, the only person that's ever achieved anything of value is the Lord Jesus Christ. And He achieved everything of all value. So you need to use, know that for your spiritual maturity. But also, if you're going to lead in the church, if you're going to teach in the church, if you're going to serve in the church, what's the first thing you do when you walk into a room full of problems? You, walk, you get called into a church with just a train wreck. What's the first thing you do? Take charge? No. You exercise humility. And let everybody see how humble you are. All right. Now, Paul has set us up. I'm telling you, he has set us up. Because he used this word called as an apostle. Kletos apostolos. Now let me read verse 2 to you 
Paul called as an apostle. Verse 2, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. Now here's the deal. And this, by the way, is, is the way it is in Greek. Kletos apostolos. There is no as and, there is no verb. It simply says, Paul called apostle. And when he addresses the church, you know what he addresses them as? Called saints or the holy people of God. In other words, you want to describe me? I'm called apostle. If I want to describe you, called holy people of God. In other words, if I said to you, your pastor's been saved by grace through faith and you have been saved by grace through faith, what did I just do? I put us all in the same boat. Now there's implications of me being saved by grace through faith, right? Guess what? There's implications for you being saved by grace through faith. And you miss this in the English because it's not balanced, but in the Greek, it's kletos apostolos. In the Greek, once you get to verse 2, it's kletos hagias. Called apostle, called holy. People of God. He just put us all in the same boat. So everything verse 1 meant for Paul, huh? Verse 2 means for the church at Corinth. Now you just think about what all this means. Um, <laughs> Paul's calling was solely a work of God. You get that? I tell you what, get your Bibles, turn to Acts 9 real quick. Go left. Acts 9, let me read in verse 10. Acts 9 verse 10 says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. I'll tell you what, let me back up to verse 1 so you'll know what's going on in Paul's life at, in, at this time. Now Saul, in verse 1, who is Paul, was still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord Jesus, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, either men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So that's what's going on in Paul's life. Down in verse 10 now. There was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to Straight Street and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying, and he has seen in a vision named, a man named Ananias that will come and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Ananias was no dummy. Look at verse 13. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Look at verse 16. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. This is what Paul's calling meant for Paul. What was Paul doing before he was called? Putting Christians to death and persecuting the church of God. What were you doing before you were called of God into the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ? Listen, God didn't look down on you and think, oh, he's getting it. He's a good man. He's honest. He's a hard worker. I like him. I'm going to call him into the family of God. No. No. You were lost and sinful and undone and separated from God. And it was solely a work of God and a work of grace. Paul was going in the other direction. And God called him. And just like me, I was going in the other direction. And God said, no. I'm calling you to myself. And that's the way he's done all of us who are in Christ. It was solely a work of God. Now, not only that, I want you to notice this. And I know, I know this is kind of difficult. But go back to verse 1 and just look at that for a minute. You know what? There's no verb there. Oh, there is in the English, but there's no verb there in the Greek. You know why that's important? It's an adjective. 
You know what an adjective does, remember? It describes you and helps define you. This is what it says in the Greek. Paul called apostle. Now go back to verse 2. To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, called holy. Now, let me tell you something. Paul took his calling seriously. If you still have your Bibles, head to the right and go to the book of Colossians. We're, we're winding down. Go to Colossians chapter 2. No, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 1. I'll start in verse 24. Look how seriously, Colossians 1, 24, Paul takes this calling. Now remember what God said when he called him. I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Colossians 1, 24 says, Now I rejoice, Paul says, in my sufferings. How bizarre. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Remember his calling? And in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, and filling up. What is lacking in Christ's afflictions? Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. Paul got called to do two things, to suffer and to preach. And you know what he said at the end of his life? I have filled up suffering and I have filled up preaching. That was the call that God placed on my life. And I filled them up. Let me ask you a question. God's got a calling on your life. Kletos Hagias, you are called holy. Have you filled up the holiness of God in your life? We got to change the way that we think, do we not? This was, God, this was Paul's passion and pursuit. This is what he gave his life. He poured his life into what God said he was. This is the way God described Paul. Paul, you are called apostle. And then he looks to everybody in this room that's in Christ and he says, and you, you're called holy. Are you going to give yourself to these things? Are you going to fill your life up in these things? Oh, there's so much work to do. There's so much work to do in my life. There's so much work to do in your life. Do you want to be at the end of your life and stand before the Lord and go, Well, I know you call me God. But with a half-hearted, weak, failing attempt, I gave it about 2%. My hobby, I gave 110. My job, at least 100. My family, best I could. My calling, well, thank God I'm saved by grace, right? Amen. Come on. You're called holy people of God. Don't end your life with a half-hearted, half-effort that brings shame to the glory of God. Last thing, um, I, I jotted these verses down for you. Paul's calling left him under obligation. Um, you thought it choice, I guess, but no, it's, it's more than a choice for you to be holy. It's an obligation. Let me give you these passages. Don't try to turn there. We'll, we'll, for the sake of time, I'll run through these quickly. Paul says when he was given his testimony, he says... While so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priest at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when, we had fallen, when all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now look at this. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Some of you older folks remember what goads were, I guess. 
um, the pointy spikes that they put on the front of the plow so when the mule bucked up and didn't want to pull that plow, he'd kick back and he'd hit one of those wooden spikes at the pile and it would hurt him and he would get back to plowing. That was a goad, a wooden spike to get the animal moving. God says to Paul, I have called you to be an apostle. Why are you kicking against the goads? Plow the field that I put you in. Now let me tell you something, child of God. God has called you holy. Why are you kicking against the goads and not walking in holiness? Don't be like a stubborn mule. Give your life wholly to the one who called you. And stop kicking the goads. Look what he says in Romans 1.14. He says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Look at 1 Corinthians 9. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For I am under compulsion. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Have you ever gotten up in the morning and thought, if I don't walk in holiness today, woe to me. That's how serious your calling is. That's how serious my calling is. Woe to me if I don't walk like a called child of God. Last thing, look what Peter says about this. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust, which were yours in your ignorance, meaning before salvation. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. And then he reminds us in chapter 2, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possessions. You see, that's, that's not just a greeting. Paul sets them up. He says, listen, kletos apostolos, that's my obligation. I'm called apostle. And then in verse 2 he goes, kletos hagias, called holy. You have an obligation to be holy in all your behavior. Let's pray.